areas of Canada. The reason why Western Europe is not nearly as cold as a climate is because that Gulf Stream pulls a tremendous amount of warm water toward Western Europe. Similar situation, why is it always so cold in the water in California? San Francisco can be chilly, downright cold in the summertime. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain said uh, the longest winter uh, he ever spent was one summer in San Francisco. And again, it's that California current bringing cold air from the north uh, to the south. So these ocean currents created by wind patterns have a major impact on transferring heat north and south. It's called the Great Ocean Conveyor, and it's one of the most powerful forces on the planet. It's made up of warm currents which travel at the surface, whilst at the bottom of the ocean are much colder currents. The conveyor transports oxygen, nutrients and warmth around the world. It's vital to the health of all life on Earth. Yet the conveyor wouldn't keep flowing if it wasn't for what happens in the cold northern oceans. This is where the surface water sinks to join the deep water currents. The sinking happens because the water's very cold. This makes it dense and heavy, so it plunges to the bottom of the ocean. And it's the sinking water which keeps the entire conveyor moving. As it travels south, it hugs the ocean floor until it warms at the equator, where it eventually rises to complete the circuit. Without cold water sinking at the poles, the ocean conveyor would collapse. The sea would no longer be supplied with oxygen and nutrients. It would become stagnant and lifeless. It takes roughly a thousand years for water to circulate all the way around the conveyor. And this global network of currents controls the well-being of the entire planet. Without it, our world simply wouldn't function. We'll wrap up our conversation about atmospheric circulations and chapter seven with a conversation about teleconnections. Now, teleconnections, uh, something that scientists really have only got a, a good handle on, have only achieved a good handle on over maybe the last 20 to 30 years. And really a teleconnection, which is the ocean-atmosphere interaction in which sea surface temperatures in one part of the globe literally influence weather patterns in other parts of the globe. Uh, teleconnections really could be an entire course in the study of advanced atmospheric sciences. So we're just going to really touch on this and talk briefly about uh, what is the most famous teleconnection, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So uh, teleconnections, again, ocean-atmosphere interactions where sea surface temperatures in one spot change weather patterns in other spots. The most famous being the El Nino Southern Oscillation, where El Nino is the warming of the eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. That occurs in about intervals of maybe two to seven years, and El Nino is caused by the flipping of surface pressure patterns at opposite sides of the equatorial Pacific. That's the Southern Oscillation. Now, non-El Nino years, and what's sometimes referred to as La Nina, although I think La Nina is really falling out of favor with the scientific community. Non-El Nino is what we'd find typically in the uh, equatorial Pacific Ocean, and La Nina would be following an El Nino where pressure changes strengthen easterly trades, and then large amounts of cold water move west around the across the equatorial Pacific. So we can talk about all these different pressure patterns, how they affect different parts of the world, and why. The key to the El Nino teleconnection will be the pressure patterns. And in non-El Nino conditions, or just your typical conditions, you have low pressure that's going to be on the western side of the Pacific Ocean and high pressure on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. And that's completely about global circulations, counterclockwise flow south of the equator, clockwise flow north of the equator, bringing cold water from the north along North America and cold water from the south 
along South America, creating sinking air and high pressure uh, on the eastern side of the Pacific Basin and then uh, the, the warmer water on the western side. Now, this illustration does not do the Pacific Ocean justice. The Pacific Ocean is just so massive, and it's why this uh, ability of a change in temperature on the Pacific Ocean to affect weather uh, in other areas, because when you change the temperature over the eastern equatorial Pacific, it's such a massive region of oceanic real estate that it can literally affect other parts of the world. So, Non-El Nino conditions, low pressure west, rising air, Indonesia, Jakarta, even parts of Australia, nice and wet, nice and rainy, exactly what you'd expect. All right, And then high pressure on the eastern side, sinking air, cold water, uh, upwelling. And you can see that thermocline. That's underneath the ocean. That's the line of temperature where warm water is, warm water is very deep in the west and cold water uh, is, very, uh, is very shallow uh, in the east. In a... El Nino event, the pressure pattern flips. Large global scale shifts allowed the low pressure to shift to the eastern side. So we get low pressure or atmospheric pressure falling off the coast of Ecuador and Peru and atmospheric pressure rising uh, over the along Indonesia. And so that sinking air to the west and the rising air to the east literally causes a strong countercurrent to develop. Look at the northern illustration. That high pressure and low pressure, not only does it create winds, trade winds, but it pushes that water back. It pushes that water across the Pacific Ocean. So all the warm water is literally piled up to the west. Well, when that atmospheric pressure pattern flips, that warm water that's piled up to the west literally flows downstream and to the east. And water along the coastline of South America that is typically very, very cold warms up very, very quickly. Warmer water, uh, no upwelling, no cold water, no nutrients, no fish. That's very bad for the Ecuadorian and Peruvian uh, fishermen. But not only that, you see this dramatic change in weather conditions. And not just weather conditions along the coast of South America, but across uh, other parts of the equatorial regions as well. So again, on the bottom we have our El Nino conditions on the left and our non-El Nino, maybe even La Nina conditions uh, to the right. Uh, you have uh, your uh, low pressure that has uh, formed basically in non-El Nino conditions over Indonesia. This is going to be on the right at the equatorial Pacific and high pressure just off the coast of, of Ecuador. And you have that uh, water being pushed back toward uh, the west and all the warm water pooling and that low pressure to the west creating rising air. So that is your non-El Nino conditions or La Nina conditions. And then on the left, that pressure pattern flips and all that warm water flows back down toward uh, North, uh, South America and Central America. And you get all that warm water in the equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean, the eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. So how does that affect the atmosphere so that it actually has a change in weather patterns? Well, if you look at the La Nina or non-El Nino conditions, the typical jet stream pattern is for the northern branch of the jet stream to be really quite far north uh, and dip down south over uh, the uh, central parts of North America, right on down, digging down in the front range of the Rockies and bringing cold air oftentimes as far south as, uh, as uh, the southeastern states. That's a typical pattern. When you get this very warm air in the equatorial uh, parts of the eastern uh, Pacific Ocean. Look at our, our left. Warm air causes that air to thicken. The cold air there to the north, the air is thinner. So you literally get a stronger jet stream that is displaced well to the south. So that southern branch, the branch of the jet stream, not only is it much stronger, but it's displaced well to the south, bringing very wet weather right across the southern tier, uh, northern parts of New Mexico and the south uh, eastern states. And so that is the primary effect. And that southern branch of the jet stream being stronger and displaced far to the south in El Nino years causes very active weather patterns uh, along that region. Now, interestingly enough, we'll learn when we talk about tropical storm formation, that stronger jet stream to the south, that southern branch of the jet, uh, actually results in fewer hurricanes when there's an El Nino year. Uh, there are other uh, of these uh, teleconnections, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Arctic Oscillation, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, some having uh, changes in weather patterns over months uh, and even years in some cases, but the concept of teleconnections, sort of a new part of meteorology and climatology uh, and the real opportunity for study in the future. So that wraps up Chapter 7 from Introduction to Meteorology on Atmospheric Circulations. Coming up next is Chapter 8, Air Masses, Fronts, and the Mid-Latitude Cyclone.